This is your last margin call with your host, Beck and Tim. All right, we're coming to you from March 16th. Um, it's crazy what's going on today. We have about, uh, I think we went down, what was it, 12% today and got a little bit freaking crazy when it comes to this. Um, but in times of this, you know, you kind of always need to kick back and just relax and have yourself a drink um, in order to maintain that cool edge in the market. Um, tonight, I'm just drinking just straight a vodka lemonade because whatever, it's like a triple vodka with a splash of lemonade when it comes to this because you kind of need that. Um, but tonight we have our guest um, here. He is TJ from United Traders. Um, he's been close with me for a long time. I've, I've loved his strategy. I've loved his insight. I have just respect him as entirely as a person when it comes to this. Um, and that's why I invited him onto the show tonight was because I wanted to get his insight just because I know that he's there. He, he has had experience with this and I want to pick his brain when it comes to this. So TJ, why don't you tell us number one, what you're drinking first and then kind of tell us who you are. All right, so for me, I got Bud Light Orange. I don't know. My friend got me into it. We were at a beach one day. He brought it, and I was like, what is this orange dr fruity drink? And um, <laughs> after that, you know, I just fell in love with it. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm rolling. That's okay. That's okay. We don't need nothing fancy. Sometimes you just need to get down to the what feels good. And that's, exactly. That's, that's Bud Light Orange. Exactly. <laughs> but on a day like today, your drink is probably more appropriate. Uh, it's it's three shots and just a tiny bit of splash of lemonade. <laughs> Damn, okay. Whatever, you know, that's fine. Whatever. We all have alcohol addictions, but that's okay. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I'm the founder of uh, United Traders. The group itself, I designed it because I couldn't find some sort of like a support group to help me when I started my trading career. So, you know, I guess we could start with that. So yeah. I started trading back about 11 years ago so i had ten thousand dollars i saved up from selling used car parts over the summer and that was my student loan amount so i was getting ready to pay it off and then i realized like what if i can just earn something so like some money to just pay pay for the interest right so at the time the interest portion on my student loan was five point uh, five percent so I went to my financial planner and I asked him hey is there a way that I can just keep this money in my pocket and just invest in something that I can make 5.5 percent and that's when he showed me a slew of just mutual funds so I was going through all of them um, and actually technically it was a book so he gave me a prospectus and took it home with me Okay. reviewed it and I saw the portfolios that he was mentioning where it actually has a growth rate that I was looking for almost all of them the top 10 holdings had Apple so I'm like okay at that time trading I think it was like 1595 or 2095 uh, per trade um, so you know I was like okay it's not too bad uh, in that aspect and it, I only have to pay it once and then pay it against when I sell so I went all right all in on Apple and <laughs> okay. you know I kind of lucked out on that you know and it's thanks to him too that he mentioned it um, so then I believe I got in around that $200 mark on Apple now this is without any technical skills nothing like I literally went on um, Yahoo Finance looked at Apple looked at a line graph and uh, bought Apple I was like all right this is how I buy it and uh, no mark no limit order just straight marketed it and Smart. don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then seven, I think it hit about $700 in about a year or two. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, I actually made money from doing this. And I, before then, I didn't actually think you could. You know, what we're taught in school is just like, oh, you know what, 7%, 5% overall, year over year. That's usually what the type of return that you're going to make. And for me to just be there in like a year or two and just turn, you know, my $1,000 up to, I think it's like, I think it was like 70000 when I got into Tesla. Yeah. I was so surprised. And it was literally just like, uh, just trading uh, Apple. So I bought it. I held it for the first few years. As soon as it came down from, I think it was around 650s 
and he came down to like 550s. That's when I kind of just like, okay, I think it's going to go down and it's going to continue. So I sold it. And then as soon as I saw it recover again, I just bought it again. And these were more like swing trades. But at the time, I didn't even know what the meaning was. I was just like looking at a line ch- chart and like, oh, okay, it's going up. Let me just get back in. Right. <laughs> and that's how it all started. Now, back then there was like no help at all right like i went online there was um absolutely like no websites uh, that i can follow and um i tried following a couple uh i believe it was like investors hub was there and i was reading through the post and it was just so much noise and, and i just couldn't learn anything for myself like there's a lot of plays that people mentioned why the stock is good or why the stock is bad but nothing about the trading and like how can I get better and improve? So that's the entire story. That's why I started United Traders, just to work as a team as effectively as we can. I mean, more eyes on the market means more opportunities, opportunities that sometimes I'd miss. And together, we kind of like teach and grow traders mm-hmm. into becoming better using strategies. You know, I'm really big on having set rules and having guidelines, you know, so rules where you have to stick to it guidelines which you can kind of deviate depending on your confidence level so are when you started off are i know you're canadian when it comes to this uh different exchanges are you strictly trading on the canadian exchange uh where were you starting at specifically when you were targeting this did you jump right into nyse anywhere else yeah so for me the Canadian dollar was higher at the time. It was right after 2008, the market crashed. So I'm like, okay, where am I going to get the best value? And, you know, having a finance background and also working in the industry, I was like, okay, U.S. dollar is a is a better deal for me. And uh, that's why I went with Apple. It was literally just because the Canadian dollar was higher at the time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's what I feel like. Because I feel like um, when everybody hears that, they're like, what? Apple wasn't trading that high? Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, he, you know, different exchanges, different markets, different pricing and everything else like that. So I wanted to make sure that they, they saw you that side of things and didn't think that like, oh, this guy's just bullshit in this side of things. Like different. Prices. No, actually, they had a seven to one split, actually. And uh, that's that's why I Apple's you know that. not I, I'm sorry. over seven hundred bucks right now. <laughs> I forgot about that. I'm sorry. That's my oh, fault. It was <laughs> Believe me, I don't expect <laughs> to remember. I only remember because I traded it. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was I was fresh out of high school at that time. At 2008, was that as you're saying you were? When yeah, it was? it was about 2008, 2009 when I started. So oh, yeah, shit, yeah. I was no, I was I, I was fresh into university at that time. I don't yeah. There's no way I was paying attention to that. I was all about catching bottoms in a different sense, but that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't so. all we all were. <laughs> so, all right. So when you, when you started out and did this and, and you got into the markets and everything and you got United Traders going, um, that's how I found you. And I think it was just some random person that, you know, said like, oh, come check out this group um, and, you know, they're better. And then like, I like, I, I went in there typically always skeptical of everything i go in there and be like all right let's figure out let's figure out where they do and like i'm not gonna lie i instantly gravitated towards you i'm like this guy is talking knowledge that i know i i can understand i know he's not bullshitting he's not trying to work a scheme and i think that's why i kind of like always respected you in that sense and why i'm holding this and i think why is as a listener you know anything that he has to say and i think you know whether it becomes from experience um, work, you know, being in the work field itself and, and knowledge, I think it's just something to hear about, um, which kind of leads me into my next thing, the topic of just, you know, we're in a time where at least aware of what was going on more than I was at the time, um, comparatively, um, trading this time right here in 2020, comparatively to coming out of the great financial crisis, you know, everyone wants to know for people that have traded that, what's it like? What is this anything similar? Is this something like, are we not even on the verge of something yet? Um, why don't you give me just a little bit more insight on just your take on that? Um, if you know, maybe you just don't even remember it enough, but just let me, let me hear your take on what's going on in the markets. You know, to be honest, like back then, we didn't feel much of an impact you know i was i think like 18 at the time so i literally didn't feel any impact of a recession and and really it didn't hit home hard right Mm -hmm. um i have i didn't know anyone at the time that was like directly affected by losing jobs and and such now 
what currently what we're looking at it's just scary you know if this virus keeps spreading at the rate that it is you know it is actually going to take um uh, about a year before you know 40 percent of the population in the world gets affected yeah, right easily now exactly and the problem with that is the media is just exploiting it you know anything bad relating to coronavirus they are just milking it and at that sense you know if you coughed like i remember i had a sore throat a couple of days back and i'm like wait is that the first sign of coronavirus <laughs> dude that's exactly you know? what i did yeah. to my wife too and she's she started coughing i said oh hell fucking no like you're going to the other room for the next 14 days and you're staying there i'll i'll, I'll slide you dinner underneath the door and like that's the like the extent that we were taking it here too it's like exactly <laughs> i'm not taking any risks is what i said and, you know, our minds play games on us you know as soon as we think hey there's a possibility our minds will play tricks and mm -hmm. we'll actually like believe ourselves that we have something that we actually don't. and i think that's the problem here it was just mass hysteria yes and you know going into the market we're hoping for some good news every day we're looking we're looking for trump to come out with something saying something's going to improve but that's not what we felt in the marketplace and you know, you see that in the like the actions on SPY right now, right? Right. One of the biggest things was that this isn't something we can model. We didn't have past data that we could use and be like, hey, there's a high probability that the market can go lower. Like I spoke to a couple of my friends that are analysts and we all agreed on the same thing. We know that this is bad, except we just don't know how to model it because we don't have anything to base it on and now i think funds are going to be a little bit more cautious and more importantly prepared um the reason behind that is like we're now getting data from china right we saw retail sales slump 20 percent, and we saw fixed asset income um, investments they came down 24.5 percent, and industrial output you know it felt like 13 percent and it's ridiculous this is worse <laughs> exactly and analysts expected a three percent drop on that you know so yeah. the deviation was huge yeah. so now we can use that sort of data and we can kind of apply it to our markets and be like okay this is something that might happen in our situation and now we have like a baseline right for future analysis how, f how forward thinking do you think that those forecasts can go or do you think that they're legitimately doing a um an italy timeline and a china timeline and comparing those two and saying like all right well the u.s is going to shut down completely in a matter of two weeks and we need to base a forecast off that do you think that's the extent they're going when it comes to this like like saying like we're literally going to have no but just 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 no economy in general because everyone's going to be at home like essentially do you think I mean, they're going to factor it in, right? Okay. They have to. But again, like we don't have much data to go on. And, you know, this isn't something that's like, hey, this only affected like rural parts of the world like Ebola, right? Right. This is where it hit hard in major cities, uh, major economies, right? So it's really tough to say, especially because the rate of infection is just ridiculous. And you know, this is going through, like, it, it, it attacks your lungs, and that's mm -hmm. a huge problem, right? And you can actually be exposed to it and don't even know it for a couple of days. So, you know, that's something that everyone's going to have on their mind, and that's why the market, you know, started coming down. It's just that fear. This isn't like, hey, people are losing their jobs, the market's going down. This is, like, fear for life, right? Yeah. And that's exactly like kind of like the thing that the message that I've been pushing, like if you're a if you're a healthy individual, like you're you're mildly you don't need to worry about this is a severe pneumonia, which can be tr treatable in a in a young adult and, you know, a healthy uh, middle aged person. But like the fact that when you have it was like one point two billion people of the population are over the age of 50 and at risk, one point two billion people is a lot to lose and they're not going to take that lightly. And that's not going to be something that you just kind of like just shrug off and be like, oh, well, it's nothing because 
like that's a lot of the workforce and, and you could say that they're not all retired either because the the 40 to 60 population in america for sure as hell isn't retired so that's losing a lot of like the top end of everything when it comes to that and that's i i i worried when i first started pushing that message of it's nothing something to worry about and then i kind of regretted it towards the end in terms of don't take it seriously but if you get in contact with anybody that does have it you kind of really need to take a public health 101 standard to this when it comes to isolate yourself for the protection of your friend's grandma who can make and do it um you know somebody else's elderly parents that could be doing that and that's i think that's the problem what do you have and like i don't know if you saw recently um it's the videos on Twitter, every YouTube, news media outlets. It's like millennials are the ones that will take action against this because millennials are the ones that need to take it seriously. And as long as they're out and about, the virus continues, the virus spreads because the incubation period of that being on these inanimate objects of railings, anything else like that is just going to all of a sudden, you know, an elderly person has to go to the store in order to get something and they touch that railing that that person did two days ago or one day ago or whatever it is, and now they're at risk. So I think that's what people haven't understand is the supply chain disruption when it comes to that is so, it just unwinds everything. Like, I don't, I don't know that much about it. And I think you, I feel like you kind of know a lot more than me when it comes to that, but the actual disruption that it causes and things start to unwind and unemployment rises and then all of a sudden defaults happen. Like, is that factoring into your process? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah, so the economic implications, it can be extreme, right? And that that's the biggest fear. And like, okay, so now we see that China has retail sales going down 20%. Right. Um, some some analysts were like thinking, okay, it's going to be like a fifty percent drop, twenty percent. It's like, okay, it's a little bit better than what they've expected. Now, my biggest issue is this: it's just like U.S. household debt to disposable income is trailing at around ninety eight percent. We have household personal interest payments, which is around fifteen to eighteen percent. So, when you look at the figures, we don't have a lot of disposable income, and a lot of Americans are living. Well, not just Americans, like around the world, really, um, they're living paycheck to paycheck. So, imagine what a two or three a week incubation period could mean to them financially, right? right. And and right. then, you know, I think we're gonna see a little shift here as we have right now. You know, like banks, obviously. They're going to be going down, deleveraging as much as you can. Um, we're going to see a couple things um, happen now. Obviously, we're going. To, we already saw it today. The retail industry is just going to take some major setbacks. The biggest issue now is when the market's going down, people are going to start making cuts, laying off, reducing hours, yep. and you know the largest corporations. They're going to start doing it sooner um a because they have like smaller profit margins when as, as the company matures you have more staff profit margins tends to slim down a bit and this is going to affect you know business to business corporations you know a lot of lot of um fortune 500 corporations they have businesses with other companies um you know large scale companies as well so when they're outsourcing their workload and what if that change and now we already see their supply chain issues like 75 percent of companies are noting supply chain disruptions from china right, mm -hmm. right. and then we saw air travel being cut and uh, which also That's affects crazy. air cargo yeah it's, it's fucking crazy out there. yeah and, and the problem i think is how long will this last like I thought I talked to a pathologist about this, you know, just that we weren't prepared. We aren't ready to face the reality that this is something that is most likely going to stay with us because um, it's a little bit too late to kind of contain it. Now, we are doing our right. best job at doing it. Now, one good thing that she did mention was since this is a virus that kills its host, it tends to get weaker as you know, the next strain happened. So, like, it's not a bad thing that it's actually getting weaker. So, it's, it's actually a good thing. It's also, you know, our immune systems are going to be kind of... We're strong better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, she just said, trust modern medicine. They are working on something. And hopefully, we'll see some results soon. I think we just got phase one data. Uh, Trump was mentioning it today. Yeah, the human trials aspect of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, the other side, it's like tourism. Tourism isn't a major part of U.S.'s GDP, you know, and that's why I actually took puts on EEM. You know, EEM, I was like, okay, emerging markets has some exposure to China, actually a lot of Asia. So for me, I was looking at a way to capitalize on it. And I, uh, you know, I lucked out. I believe I got it on February 10th, I think. That's good. That's good. I can check. (laughs) That's a good entry. (laughs) I mean, mean, let's be real. If you got anywhere before March, it's a damn good entry. Like, (laughs) it's trading around 38s, actually. Let me. It's it's See. down a lot. It's down like twenty percent since then, if anything. It was definitely plus forty though. That's for no, sure. No, sorry, it's it's March tenth. My apologies. Oh, but, I, but here's even March tenth. What was it? Yeah, thirty eight. Uh, that's when I started scaling into it. It was like a second day on a pullback. Because um, as we know, I be another twenty percent killing down. us. I know, right? That's I hate that. Like, ah. Oh. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I have so oh, many words about no, like, that. With IV, you know, especially on this move down, it was so hard for me to buy puts, you know, especially because I bought leaps pretty much. I got December contracts. So I was looking for like a two day pullback at least to scale into it. Mm-hmm. Luckily for me, that one worked because I did attempt another entry, but it went against me and I had to stop out. Because those the, the pullbacks and movements on that shit is just it's it's wild when it comes to that but i mean i don't know like it everything's hindsight 2020 when it comes to that but like i don't know like you always think that like when you hear the recovering side of china and and the eastern side of the world that it could potentially just rebound it's like all right well it's good let's continue on forward and it was already a hot place to be i could see that but like what made you want to stick with it though like because we didn't have the economic data um justifying that that actually happened right yeah so we were looking forward for de- uh, for like you know weaker numbers to come out of china and it was just too soon like it happened so rapidly the market came down so rapidly that we didn't even have data to back up the reason why it you know came down hard right yeah. like uh, on an economic standpoint but now we do and now it's going to be weaker i mean even us came out with um you know more unemployment like lower unemployment sorry yeah. Higher unemployment. Higher. I, I know what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's literally what I'm expecting like this week and waiting for. Like I wanted to pull the trigger on so many things today and just be like, all right, I'm going to try to grab Microsoft under, under 140, but it's like, nah, back off a little bit. Just wait because the reaction of the cases will increase fear. The second we get an uptick in unemployment, it'll be the real like shock, like of like, yeah, this is actually real. This is actually happening. Or I could be completely wrong and it could be already priced into it as well. But like the way things are going, I just feel like it's it's best to just kind of sit on your hands and just make sure your thesis and your understanding is correct. And if it isn't, then try to adjust and then sit on your hands and wait for it to be correct. And I don't know. I, just, I, I can't justify any short term play when it comes to anything like this. But exactly, I, I, and that's I, the problem yeah. too, right? Like delinquency rates is another problem we're gonna have I didn't to face. Even think and about that shit, yep, yep, yep exactly, yep, yep. <laughs> shit. And um, you know, one of the biggest key indicators of GDP growth um, that I like to look at, and a lot of analysts too, is you know luxury gold. Uh, sorry, luxury goods that are being sold, yep. air travel, property development. Um, electronics and uh, app appliances being purchased you know all of those things are getting like l- literally affected right now right yeah. yeah so we can see a huge decline on gdp and you know goldman came out with some astronomical numbers so was it negative let's see five how or something like, yeah i was i was like whoa that's i mean but if you think about it though like i so what i've been hearing though is that literally once midweek hits like they're going to do a nationwide thing to stay ahead to make sure that they're taking the precautionary measures of the same thing as italy spain um switzerland and all those other countries is doing a a curfew aspect of things for the u.s and saying uh all restaurant bars no matter where you are we're going to shut down 14 days self-quarantine and do that and that would be justifiable because i think for every new case that arises, you have to reset the 14-day counter, essentially, for that area. Because if a case arises, that means they had exposure for that 14 days prior. 
and then all of a sudden you have to wait 14 days from then, then on and then on. It just it just continues on, and that's why the when I heard Trump say finally that July and August was the actual target of things, I was like, all right, that's actually more reasonable because things are not going to slow down. Like people just were on spring break and had to fucking be pulled off the beach because it's we're putting a curfew in effect, and yeah. And and that's where like I like when I when I saw that I was like holy shit negative five percent from Goldman like they want to do that but then it's like can you blame them if that actually goes into effect that's my biggest thing is like how do you price that in and who knows if it goes even further to like a complete like stay in your damn home we're not going to deliver you anything hunker down until for the next two weeks it's like how much would that actually affect something like all these other countries are doing so I don't I don't. I have no idea how to price that in, how to trade that, how to do that. Do you have any idea, like, what you're seeing, what you want to do, like, positions that are safe during this time? To be honest, I wouldn't even know how to model that. Uh, but, you know, you have to trust these institutions. They have teams of analysts that can actually model that, and they have access to, you know, world-class data. Um, least, yeah, I would with hope. them, yeah. when they start mentioning it, I kind of use that as a tip on my end to be like, okay, how can I you take advantage of this new information? And um, that's what I try to do, to be honest. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel, but just trying to see what they're doing and kind of see how I can actually uh, use it to my advantage. And, you know, why the market came down so aggressively, it's just like, I think JP Morgan came out with a study where they assume 60% of the market's equity trading is based on index derivatives, right? So imagine what happens when the market tank this like violently to those derivatives that they're holding on to. Mm. <laughs> and then think about the algos that are tr trading sectors or maybe like, you know, sector ETFs and such based on those derivatives right yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it just trickles down it's it gets hard to like I, I don't know like i get lost in that shit and it's just like i i give up i don't know that's the only yeah, thing i can say <laughs> exactly and typically like you know funds may allocate like one to three percent of their portfolio to hedge right mm -hmm. on a decline like this you know they're probably so far out that they weren't actually meeting their expect yeah. exactly yeah. right to cover some of those losses and we see that with ray dalio's fund coming out saying 20%. that they're 20 percent. i know and, and he's he already hedged i mean he came out saying that he had a one billion dollar hedge um on his portfolio and, and exactly yeah. so you know i think that was and we no one expected this to be this aggressive and this fast yeah. and uh, even i like i was expecting this to happen intraday but I guess it's so much easier to move price, you know, after hours on. Yes. Uh, that, exactly. Limit, right. Limit down. Limit, limit a little limit bit down. more easier. Yeah. Like. Oh. Exactly. Dude, that's that's been the hardest thing though. It's because like you, you'll take a couple positions. You'll think like, all right, well they got it under control. Like we're down thirty percent. Like, the the main thing that I have is like when I'm adding to my positions, like in all long term, is like yes, a hundred percent. Like my shares, like the commons that I take on these positions are a hundred percent going to be down. But like trying to take that little like short term like put action that I have to try to fuel the the loss that I may have on the share side of things, and then trying to run these damn spreads, like on this is like it's so fucking difficult because you get these limit down, limit ups, limit down, limit ups, and it's always. Like for the pet like I feel like what's been like five or six limit ups or down, whatever it is, total in the past like two weeks. And like I feel I don't I've never traded I never traded the great financial crisis, so I don't know. And I never traded the dot com bubble or, or heard much great detail about it. But I feel like this is a different type of volatility that people aren't used to or experienced. And they but but it's just I I, I don't know how you could possibly navigate this with perfection without instant scalping essentially i that's i i don't uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah i think those are the only two strategies a you know we cannot compete with these algos right like when their order executions are going through we are just literally chasing behind right mm -hmm. so uh, a you have to scalp the big moves when you're in those profits you know i i tend to scale out a lot more faster now like my swing trades you know it's all cut i literally 
have um, just day trades, trading a lot of TVX right now because, you know, at a $500 price point, it moves $15, $20 um, <laughs> within a couple of minutes. So it's a lot easier to trade. <laughs> I just realized that what it was. Uh, I just remember like someone. All right. So like I, I'm guilty of this, but like some of the people in like these like uh, Facebook groups where like I have or I'm out there and trying to like, you know, advertise myself and the show and whatnot. And they're like, oh, if you just short TVX every single day. And like this is this is before everything. It's like you make five percent every single day, and when you think about that, and then you pull back to what it was and what these people are doing, and like that person was trading at thirty, like four mid forties, mid forties is what they're trading at, and now what TVX is at like six hundred, and it's like that's the mentality that people have. It's like they they get so accustomed to this, and it causes just like this exponential squeeze, like and just stretch like so far, like. Like I obviously the, the I I feel I feel personal in my opinion not any financial recommendation like if you fade VIX from here VIX futures anything from here and it given like a month or two time I feel like you you should be okay I that's my feel I do you feel any different when it comes to that though so for me you know it depends on the coronavirus right and yeah. the outlook of that like I do see an extended period of time where we're gonna high have higher VIX, um, you know, I, I'd say between 30 to 45 should be like the norm. Actually, yes. 25 to 45. Um, so yeah, fading it from here still makes sense, right? It's a really good opportunity. You wouldn't go too heavy onto the position. Oh, yes. <laughs> but, you know, if you want some sort of a lottery play, all right, that's not a bad time. <laughs> well, like, so that's what I was looking at. So I was like, I was trying to look at like, just give me some type of like historical like reference of times. And it's like, it was 2011. We're, we're trading in like a huge spike off of, um, was, it was 2011 or 2010, the flash crash. But w whatever one of the time was, it was, VIX was elevated during that time. And, you know, it maintained a range between like, we'll just call it 50 and 30. And it was for over a month period. And so if that's why I'd like, if you drag it out a month, month or two, like there has to be, there's not even the, the financial crisis time lasted more than six months. And it didn't last that high in the 80s for longer than like maybe a couple days, maybe a week. So that's where I'm just like, this has to be the most stupidest play in the world in order to not do this and like short TVIC, short anything that's short volatility, short future, short that index itself. That's always been my play. Do you have like a stupid play in mind where you're like, this has to be a pickup. This has to be something I have to do. Whether it just be, you know, a company itself, whether it be an index, whether it be whatever, like, do you have something that you're targeting? Like, I got to get in this position and hold it for multiple years. So well, not yet, you know, once the fear dies off, I think things will switch rapidly, right? And uh, good thing you mentioned 2011 because um, I actually have data on that. That was actually 45 days where VIX stayed between 32 of yes. about 45. That's, I think you might have been the person that I, I found that for as well. I don't know if you posted that, but I know somebody posted that on Twitter and I was like, oh, that's actually a good reference. So if you did, yeah. that, bravo to you. <laughs> And I think the other time would be like 2008, but 2008, um, when we had that crash, that was the only time that we had VIX trading at like 80, right? Yeah. This is the second time that we had this now, <laughs> right? It's so it's kind of scary. About, yeah. It's, it is. And I, in 2008, it happened twice. So it hit 80, came back down to about 47, and then went right back up to 80. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, and that's, that's why I don't want to be short. That, so, so I've been taking uh, verts on that to the to the downside on that, and then I just have like an open exposure twenty and then thirty on that as well. So like, but those are all April dated, which is looking stupid now since I took it last week because I thought, you know, being thirty percent down would be like boomers would be like, oh my god, this is a great investing opportunity. I'm going to invest my my whole pension portfolio whatever the fuck i have and just dump it into this being 30 percent down and that's backfired a little bit but you know hopefully by april maybe I'll, I'll look like a genius but probably not when the way things are going right now that's what i, I just i can't figure out like i'm i have this i can't not that i can't figure out i just don't know what exactly could be safe in terms of this virus and shutting down a, a supply because you have like boeing out there Boeing's down like what, like fucking like sixty plus percent, and 
three months ago, Boeing was the hottest fucking thing that could ever happen. And then, you know, you have all these other names like SQ. You have these software names that are just like bursting and just ready to go. And everybody talks about it being late cycle. But that's that's when those names shine. But then it's just like, um, do you just do you jump back into those expecting this to be a full recovery? Because it's just a, just a weird event. Like, do you have like any couple names that like when things do start to look like they're bothering bottoming? Um, that you want to target like maybe if you don't even want to do direct names like what sectors you want to be want to be heavily invested in for me it's going to be tech you know i like the growth i like the profit margins and you know it's like a strong sector it's one that i understand and it's one that i'll you know continuously keep investing into now for me you know crm crm since i believe 2015 they've had maybe one quarter where they made think a 0.1 or 0.2 percent increase the rest have been higher Mm -hmm. right so going with a company with that kind of track record that just went down because of the market you know that's an easy buying opportunity a couple others you know i like software as a service um, ai so i'm looking into a couple different tickers that i personally like like smar is uh one of them um, DDOG. I haven't, I missed the rally on DDOG. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm probably going to get this opportunity now. Um, I still strongly like Roku. Roku with that high revenue growth. I still believe that that's a, you know, a viable option as well. Okay. Um, except today, like tonight, someone actually put up a $6 million <laughs> uh, offer. So there's only three companies that have more than $6 million um dollars sorry six million shares in that company and that's fidelity and i believe blackrock and i believe citadel okay. so you know as soon as i saw that after hours i was like okay maybe i'll just sit on my hands on Roku yeah, for wait, now. Just, just to see what happens and pull back on it well or, yeah it would be banking like, on the consumer not going to the stores picking this up using the online shipping or anything else like that but like are they is roku tackling any other side besides the active like storefront side of things like do they have i don't know anything about roku so i'm that's why i'm kind of like diving a little bit into this like what do they have besides like being the tv integrated side of things or um the actual the tv console themselves ad revenue uh that's the one thing that they're actually surprised like it was actually a surprising increase and that's something that they are going to be focusing on now the biggest opportunity i think for roku is a buyout candidate right like just imagine if another company like walmart wants to get into the space like this is an ideal company for the picking and it's a great opportunity if they ever do a deal like that i'm not saying that they will but you know could be could be a good opportunity for both parties right yeah and Roku's strong you know their sales is strong their books are clean it's looking better um eps wise you know they're improving and it's performing like way more than what's expected. Okay. All right. So, so you have Roku, you have the tech sector. Do you have any other sector that you're kind of like maybe iffy on? Maybe you want to like, maybe if this happens or like, yeah, I would take a flyer on this and I would just toss money at it just to see what happens based off of a reaction of this. Or are you just strictly um, like um, focused on tech just in general, no matter what it does? So there is going to be like a couple sectors that are going to get hit the hardest. Um, so I want to see some buying opportunities on, hmm, actually, that's a tough one. Say, well, I never got into the whole hotel business, right. but W-Y-N-N, uh, right, Win. Yeah. That one doesn't look too bad, and it looks a lot more attractive now. MGM is looking good. I mean, and Disney, to be honest, Disney... I love Disney, so I am as soon as I can get an entry on <laughs> Dude, I've been waiting for sub-90s on that for almost a week, and it's been just a pain in the ass waiting on that shit. Just because I, I just feel like the, the park side of things, the at the streaming side of things, their, their forecast will be met before they even get that. So, like, Disney's always up there, but, like... That that's definitely one of my things, and then and I have a buddy that like uh, he really loves the defense sector, and he says you know picking up BA has a strong potential of going 
you know, filing for bankruptcy when it comes to this in, in terms of the complete shutdown of aviation and everything else like that. But he says, like, man, if there ever was a take, time to take a chance on and Boeing, like, now would be the time at one thirty. And, like, do you feel like you're, you're going to be diving into the aviation side of things? Are you taking any airlines whatsoever at this at this point? Boeing, um, any defensive sector type things, airlines, whatever? Like, if I was investing and in trying to, like, kind of spread it between sectors, I would be. Um, Boeing, I don't know, it's just so much negative media attention that even after the coronavirus, we can have a longer period of, you know, lower uh, pricing now versus something like the airlines where, hey, if this thing is, you know, done with, you can see a, you know, a quick increase. You can see consumer confidence going back up, more tra air travel, and, you know, more businesses are going to flourish. So I think going with the airlines is a better bet. And, you know, one of the lessons I learned, don't try and pick a needle in the haystack, just you know, by the haystack in that sort of um, sense, right? Yeah. yeah. Would you would you try to tackle a like if you if you wanted to dive into that? Would you just go the ETF route? Is that what you're saying? Like um... ETF. Yeah. Okay. Or honestly, like um, like if you're doing shares, just buy all three. You know what is it? Um, Delta, United, um, UAL. Yeah. 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 All those all those names. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So like all right. So. We, I, I got your, I got your take on the whole, th um, the whole coronavirus take on, you know, like the, the risk and factors involved. We're talking about like, you know, the, the factors of unemployment could potentially be on the rising to kind of sh shoot us down a little bit. Uh, we got your picks on a couple investing things that we could possibly look at, you know, like for bottoming, short term, long, medium term. When it comes to this, was there anything else that you wanted to hit tonight? Um, in terms of just like, um, what you would want the casual person to, to, to know in general. I think no matter where the market goes, um, what's more important is just managing that risk, right? Like you got to have a fundamental biasness on whether you're long or short of the market and you have to follow through with it right now. You can't make money if you don't make a bet on one side or the other. And, you know, as long you don't have to have the entire picture, you don't have to know where this is going to go. Right. As long as you're in a play, you think it's good, you, you know, you cap your losses and you kind of play it a bit more strategically. So for me, with higher volatility, short term, like all my trades are going to be short term. I have leaps. The only reason I have I use options is just it's cheaper. So mm -hmm. instead of me shorting spy, I can just short it with um you know, I think I got the two, uh, 295 September puts. I'm so glad, by the way, when Trump came out and he's like, June to <laughs> August. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the timing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's perfect for you, man, when it comes to that, especially. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping it continues um, down just enough that I can quickly capitalize on that and um, hopefully just flip the switch, go on the long side and that's what I'm going to be focused on, uh, focusing on right now, which is looking at the best sectors. For me, it's profit margins, positive EPS, you know, consistent growth. Like, you know, a lot of people ask me, why don't you buy this stock or FSLR or like a company that isn't performing up to standard? Some right. some that don't don't even have a positive EPS. And I'm like, guys, everything is on a fire sale right now. Exactly. Just you can literally buy like the Fang stocks and make money. Just yeah. buy it, hold it. Three years later, you'll thank me. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to like say, but like obviously mine's been like a little bit higher than like saying that now. <laughs> So that's the only problem that I have is like I was saying like yeah 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 buy everything in like the twenty eight hundreds for ES futures, and it's like here we are at like twenty four hundred and I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah let's hopefully you don't think like discredit me off of that but like when it comes to it like if you take a twenty like, if someone offers you something a twenty percent discount on something you want that's what I always like use the metaphor why wouldn't you take it because you're already willing to buy it full price and someone offers you twenty percent thirty percent off of what you want. I think it's time to jump in when it comes to that, especially, and like, you don't need to know, you need to know enough in order to get you by, but you know, most of the time being the stock picker is like investing in something, you know, something you trust, something that you've seen work. Um, 
and those are the times that I feel like, you know, getting these FANG stocks, is, they did so well because they did so well, essentially, like the stupid metaphor that it is. But I don't know, that, that's, that's my whole take on it when it comes to it. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I re- genuinely want to have you back. I genuinely want to continue. You know, we'll get you back for a couple more things. Hopefully when ER season is going again, um, we'll get your take on a couple of plays as well. Or we'll just have you back on in a couple of weeks in general just to talk about the hopefully a market bottoming or market drop or whatever the hell we're going to do. Hopefully, I just I just want to get you back on. I just always liked your opinion. I always liked your stance on things. So I hope to have you back soon. Yeah, I can't wait. And, um, you know, even stocks like Facebook that just lit unreasonably went down, you know, people were willing to pay a premium just a couple months ago. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. going to be so buying opportunities. And I think this is like, if you don't, you only get two recessions or three recessions in your lifetime. Exactly. If you don't capitalize on them, you're missing out exactly. on a lot of and the best entries. Yeah, that's what i'm saying like 2000 everybody was like oh no 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 no, whatever and then it was like the 2008 why well, don't trust anything else and then here we are again we're down 20 25 to 30 percent it's like just take a chance like what's the worst thing that can happen you lose a paycheck you lose a couple paychecks or you just gain a couple like a few hundred paychecks i don't know what the hell it could possibly be doing but i just feel like you gotta exactly. take a, you gotta take a chance at some point you have yeah, to. and you do, you do, and this is the time, you know, like, okay, not right now, but, you know, after this coronavirus fear goes down, you know, it's a really good time. This, is, this isn't this is an economic issue, you know, people will yes. get back to work as soon as this thing dies down, exactly. everything's going to go back to normal, business as usual, mm-hmm. you know, these are good buying opportunities, and hopefully people are going to capitalize on them. I think so too. I am I am on that boat as well. The second that this fades, it's going to be, and it, I know people hate to agree with Trump when it comes to this, but it really will be because it would be like, oh, okay, it's gone. Now I can rehire. Now I can now I can increase everything else. I can get all our our clients back onto this and everything. I think everything will boom from this once it fades and once it you know the fear is gone so i definitely agree with that um we have to end it here tonight uh but i can't thank you enough and i hope to have you back i seriously it's, it's been awesome it's been a pleasure um we'll definitely be in contact uh when it comes to this though so definitely truly honored thank you so much and, and if you if you don't know and you listen to this whole thing united traders um i'll throw up a link in the uh the youtube video i'll throw up a link uh let you know where he's at join him listen to him he's fun he's pleasurable when it comes to this he knows what he's talking about you'll enjoy him all right so i'll see you guys later tonight have a good one